Uh, welcome to our session today. Uh, it's called The Meeting of Two Worlds, First Nations Australian STEM Solutions and Immersive Technologies. I'm Rebecca Vivian and I'm a Senior Research Fellow and Project Lead at the Computer Science Education Research Group or known as CESA. Um, and uh, and the project lead for our CESA STEM professional learning team um, at the University of Adelaide. And I've been working on programs to upskill staff in digital technologies and mathematics. Um, and I also undertake research in computer science education and STEM education. Today, I'm thrilled to be joined by Dr. Katie Morris. Uh, Katie works with Professor Chris Matthews at the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Mathematics Alliance, or known as ATSIMA, and has previously worked on developing the Australian curriculum content elaborations for the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander histories and cultures for mathematics. And we've been very lucky um, to have Katie consult with us on behalf of ATSIMA in the development of culturally responsive maths pedagogy, content for our free teacher professional learning courses in maths, and to continue our work bringing First Nations STEM innovation into mathematics and technology subject areas. I'm also joined by Rita May Ellen Ross, who is from the First Nations Aranda group in Alice Springs, and she is a student at the University of Adelaide studying teaching, and she's also an educator consultant at ATSIMA. And Rita May has uh, done a fantastic job developing the lesson plan exemplar, which you'll see today on spear throwers. And she's also worked with us in delivering workshops at the Aboriginal Student STEM Congress in South Australia, which has been run by the Department of Education in SA. Um, so thank you, Katie and uh, Rita May for joining us today. We're thrilled to be part of this session. I would like to start by acknowledging the Kaurna peoples who are the traditional custodians of the land on which I'm joining from today on the Adelaide Plains. And I also acknowledged the traditional custodians of country and place throughout Australia from which you're joining from today and the deep feelings of attachment and relationship of the First Nations peoples of Australia to country and place. I respect and value First Nations people's connection to land, sea, sky and waters. And we know that First Nations peoples of Australia were the first STEM innovators and have been creating solutions for over 65,000 years. And I would like to acknowledge their enduring and continuing contributions to STEM and education. Here um, on this slide, you can see an installation which is on Ghana country at the University of Adelaide. And the Ghana peoples have an ancient and continuing relationship between the World Lapari, which is the Milky Way, and the Karawirapari, which is the River Torrens that runs through Adelaide on country, uh, past North Terrace campus um, on the Ghana country. And this installation shows this relationship represented uh, with Wangu, which is seven in Ghana language, um, large aluminium poles with laser cut um, decorations and story um, and knowledge and knowledges and cultures that come through that through hand-drawn circles. And I'm joined by Katie who would also um, yes, like to... Thanks, thanks Beck. I'm uh, coming to you from Carter Pittinga, which is Kangaroo Island in South Australia. And um, I want to acknowledge the significance of Kangaroo Island to the Gaon and Ngarindiri and Narunga peoples of mainland South Australia. I'd also want to acknowledge the Adnumatna peoples of the uh, Northern Flinders Ranges in South Australia who took me under their wing quite a few years ago and made me into who I am and what I am today. Thanks, Beck. And this se session today is based on a collaboration between ATSIMA and CESA. So ATSIMA have um, essentially developed all of what you'll see today. Uh, they've done a, a brilliant job um, on present collecting this, um, the background information right through developing uh, lesson plans and content for you. Uh, and we've partnered on the use of uh, how we could incorporate and integrate the technologies that you'll see today. So I'm going to hand over to Katie to get us started. Great that so many of you are acknowledging country and great to see where uh, so many of you are coming, you're coming from. Thank you for that. Okay, so today we're going to be going over, 
briefly Professor Matthew's Gumpi model, which is central to um, our teaching and learning processes that we use. We're going to look at the nine rich contexts um, that Chris and I wrote elaborations for, for the Australian Curriculum Maths. You're going to learn about the spear thrower and uh, we're going to show you the lesson that um, Rita May has developed and the teacher background information, which provides cultural and mathemat mathematical information for you. And then how this links to the digital technologies and mathematics and physics. And then we're also going to show you briefly a couple of other lessons that are, will be available for you around fish, fish traps and nets and, and architecture. So before we go any further, um, I just want to you people be aware that, um, that this session may contain images, voices or names of people who have since passed away. So this person you can see is Professor Chris Matthews, who um, Bex already mentioned. Um, as, as Bex said, Chris and I worked together to develop that content for the maths curriculum. He also developed this, the Gumpi model, which I know some of you have heard of, which, um, which we use in our teaching and learning, as I said. We know that this pedagogical approach, the Gumpi model, um, is effective or it impacts on all students' engagement in learning, not just Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, Islander students. Um, we know all students benefit from culturally responsive maths education. So the lesson that you'll see shortly is, as I said, based on the Gumpi model. But before we, or, be, or actually before we go any further, I'll go into a bit more detail about the Gumpi model on the, in the next slide um, and introduce you to that. Um, the Gumpi model, as I said, supports the teaching and learning of culturally responsive maths. Um, using the Gumpi model, allows students to reflect on their world and identity as part of the reality. So we're looking at the reality circle at the moment. If you can click, please, Beck. The reality of what they want to understand. Then they go through the abstraction process, where, which is the top arrow, where they create multiple representations through language, symbols, drawings, stories, and so on of the concepts and processes that they're interested in. These abstract representations become part of a body of knowledge, which is called mathematics, which is in the cloud there, and allows students to explore the world in an abstract form to gain further insights. So that process of abstraction is really important because it allows kids to express themselves culturally, their own cultural expressions around the reality before we go into the maths cloud. Students can then critically reflect on the mathematical constructs to ensure they've represented maths concepts and processes accurately, as well as investigate other concepts that connect with the maths concept. And when we go having a look at the spear throw lesson, you'll see some opportunity, you'll see where we've made connections. Um, so the Gumpi model is a cycle that can be interpreted as, evol as an evolutionary cycle that has driven the development of maths over time. Maths is not cultural, culturally free. There are three key concepts that highlight the connection between maths and culture. The, that In the middle that you can see, the creative, the symbols and the cultural bias. So using this model to teach maths allows um, for greater, for, allows for creativity, which we don't normally hear in maths, do we? Don't hear enough about the creativity of maths that goes, and this goes beyond creative thinking. Teaching um, mathematics through a creative approach allows the self-expression that I mentioned, whereby students can express their ideas using their language and how they see the world while learning key mathematical concepts. In essence, students can express their culture as part of the teaching and learning of mathematics. So we know that maths is all about symbols and symbols are fundamental to the process since they carry meaning from reality into the abstract world of maths. All those mathematical symbols are representing something in reality and telling stories. We talk about maths as storytelling in when we working with um, teachers in the Gumpi model. So in the Gumpi model, the meaning of symbols, 
which in this case, the connection between multiple symbols and how they connect to mathematical concepts and concepts from reality is an important part of the process. See, we've got um, the idea of cultural bias in there. Cultural bias can often be perceived as negative, but it is actually a natural consequence of any abstraction, where whether it's art or music or mathematics. So by recognising the cultural diversity of maths, there is the opportunity to see maths from different perspectives and all those different perspectives that kids bring to the classroom and consequently see different ways to teach maths and create innovative pedagogy. So now that you've had a, a brief look at what the Gumpy model is, what we, what we did when we were working with the maths curriculum is that um, the cross-curriculum priority was central to the work, to how we developed the elaborations. So if you're looking at country and place, there are three content, uh, three organising ideas for country and place that are coming up there that you can see now. The next one, um, if you go on to the next slide, people, there are three, again, three organising ideas that are coming up. I'm not going to read them out. And then the last one, the last key concept is culture and those three organising ideas. All of these, as I'm sure you all know, are on the Australian Curriculum website. Okay, so with that cross-curriculum priority being central to what we worked with when we wrote this content for the maths curriculum, we actually wrote over 100. There are now 90 of them in the maths curriculum. So today our key Con oh, so if you have a, if you can click, so there are our nine key, uh, our nine rich contexts. And if you click again, you'll see that in culture we had material culture, cultural expressions, and instructive games and toys. In country and place we have navigation and mapping, caring for country and place and weather and seasons. And in people, the three rich contexts are indigenous data sovereignty, architecture, and knowledge systems. Today, our um, focus is on the key concept culture through the um, through projectile technologies, and in this case, the spear thrower. In the next slide, as I mentioned, or um, there will be three lots of lessons that you get today. The, the Big one in the middle there with Rita May around the spear throwers. You're also getting something, a lesson around architecture and a lesson around fish nets and traps. And we'll come back to them again at the end of the um, at the end of the session. I love this quote. It comes from a um, an author or um, or an architect, who, uh, an architect, an archaeologist from 1936 who said that one of the most important inventions in human history is the spear thrower. This device offers a double advantage to those who use, use spears for it not only increases the leverage of the arm, thereby permitting the attainment of a more distant range, it also concentrates the entire force of delivery behind the butt of the spear to allow greater accuracy. And Rita May is gonna go into a bit more detail about that in a moment when we get on to the lesson. In the next slide, you can see closer up, here's an, another example of the spear thrower. This was collected in the 1960s from the Giles weather station in Western Australia. There are many, many mathematical thinking processes involved in the designing and making of spear throwers, including measurement, spatial reasoning and proportional reasoning, whereby the size or the, the length of the spear throw and the sides of it is made in proportion to the arm length of the user. Hence, each one is customised for each person. And the next slide, I'm going to now hand over to Rita May. You've gone backwards. Thanks, Katie. Can All right, go, so... Can you go forward a couple, Beth? To slide 17. Thank you. So 
Um, there are many various aspects of the Woomera from the action of launching a spear to the engineering of the tool itself that demonstrate mathematical and scientific concepts. So I'm going to touch on a few of these and to highlight the rich context of the Woomera. So spear throwers are found right across Australia and have many different names. Most commonly is the Woomera. And this name comes from the Darug language from the Eora Nation, which is in Sydney. The spear throwers found in Australia are unique from others found around the world because of their multipurpose nature. So they have a, a wide body, which makes them useful for carrying things and also for being used as a shield. And they have even been seen being used to create friction to start fires. To use the Woomera, a spear is loaded onto its peg, as you saw a couple of slides ago, uh, the peg that's on the end of the Woomera. You load the spear, has a small hole in the end, and it sits on there. And then the Woomera is swung, acting as an extension of the arm to propel the spear. They offer a double advantage, as Katie was saying before, of not only increasing the leverage of the arm, thereby generating more speed and distance, they also concentrate the entire force um, of delivery behind the butt of the spear to allow greater accuracy. If I could have the next slide, please. Thank you. So um, throwing the throwing action of a Woomera is a compound motion. So while using the Woomera, the hand moves in a roughly linear path with perhaps a slight arc to it, while the Woomera is swung in a circular path. The rotational motion of the Woomera provides me the mechanical advantage by amplifying the velocity of the wrist at the outer end of the Woomera where the spear sits. So we arrive at the idea of a lever as a simple machine that provides mechanical advantage. So to demonstrate this, when we did a workshop recently on these ideas, what I did was I had two volunteers come up and stand beside me. And as you can see, I have a ball thrower there. And I held that out to the side and I had these two students, one of them held onto my shoulder and the other one held onto the end of the so-called Woomera, as I was um, explaining it. I did a small rotation around slowly. And then I asked the students to describe what they could see. What's the difference between the two students? And you, you could start having students saying things like the student on the outside is moving, has moved a greater distance or is moving faster. And so we're getting to this idea that for rotational motion, an object that is on the outside of the circle is going to be moving faster than on the inside. And we have uh, a device that can amplify velocity. So in the next slide, we look at how our spear throw is made. So there's a lot of science in the engineering of the spear thrower itself. So the construction of the Woomera considers the physical properties that are required to carry out this fast and strong swinging motion. Newton's third law famously states that for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. The Woomera is made out of a high hard wood called mulga. And the reason for this is that when a spear is being launched, a large amount of force is being applied to the spear, which means the Woomera is also receiving a large amount of force from the spear. So the wood needs to be very strong so that it doesn't snap when you swing it. The joint between the body of the Woomera and the peg is constructed from spinifex resin and emu or kangaroo tendon. So when this hardens, it forms an incredibly strong joint that has to withstand that amount of force as well. The handle is also made from the same Spinifex resins to give it a bit more of an ergonomic feel to the handle. So the idea of Newton's third law also means that spear throwers are better suited to light, lightweight spears. If you think about a heavier spear, it's going to be forcing a lot more force through the Woomera. And that's those heavier spears are better suited to be thrown by hand. So these are some things when you get into designing with students in this lesson plan, as I'll discuss later, these might be some things to discuss with them. Also, when we did this workshop, I used the analogy 
if you want to talk about Newton's third law and get into some more complicated topics that perhaps your students haven't seen before, I used the analogy of wading into water. So I said, who likes going to the beach? Now imagine you're at the beach and you're walking slowly into the water and it's lovely and you can move around easily, but you're with, there with your friends and they're throwing a ball around. So you want to run to the ball. You start trying to run in the water. Now what do you notice happens? And your students will hopefully say something like, it's hard to move in the water. It gets harder when you start moving faster. And then you can say, that's because you are pushing harder on the water. So it's pushing back on you. And of course, we know that there's more complicated fluid dynamics and drag going on there, but they don't need to know that. They just need to know when you push on something, it pushes back on you. And I think that's a very effective example that most of your students will be able to relate to. So that is all from me for now. I'll hand back over to Katie to give you some examples in context. I think you're on mute, Katie. Yeah, no worries. Thanks. This example you can see here um, is actually published in the Teacher magazine a couple of years ago, but it comes from the I squared S squared project, which was an Indigenous STEM project that CSIRO ran. And this is an example um, of a teaching learning opportunity through using spear throwers. It comes from Year 7 students at Townsville High School. There's a year seven unit of work links physics and specifically levers. Students started by throwing tennis balls in the class with their arms. And then they progressed to using a ball thrower that you'd use to play fetch with your dog. So it's a lever. The, the ball thrower is a lever like the spear thrower. They tested variables, including holding the ball thrower in different positions to see if that affects how far the ball travels and using different maths, different weighted balls to see if a heavier object travels further. The ball thrower was likened to, as I said, the woomera or the sphere. Um, so if we go on to the next slide, which is already there, thinking about levers, where else do you see levers in action in everyday life? If you can put it into the chat function, where do you see levers? Think about that, the physics behind the lever, where do you see them in everyday life? And I'm gonna impersonate one right now because this is what I'm gonna be doing soon. So here I've got a hold of it, I'm gonna throw it out. <laughs> what was I doing? <laughs> oh, I'm reeling it in now. <laughs> oh, I like that. Car jacks. Yeah, the levers on car jacks. Seesaw, brilliant. Yep. Anybody get my one that I was mining? Yeah, I'm throwing it. Yay! Thank you, P. Spencer. Hey, Rachel, thank you. <laughs> okay, any other forms of levers that you could think of in everyday life? Oh, using a flat screwdriver to open a tin of paint. Oh, I like that, a tin of paint. Excellent. Okay, what about a cricket bat? A stapler? Ah, yes, excellent. Good work. Okay, let's move on. So the spear thrower is actually, can you just click it on, please? We know what they are, the spear throwers. So, yep, the ball thrower, as we mentioned earlier, for exercising your dogs are just like spear throwers, allowing for greater distance and throw. Okay, let's move on to the next one. So what you're getting today includes teacher background information. I mentioned that earlier. In that background information, you'll find, it, uh, find uh, information about the um, spear thrower itself. We've included some cultural language, which is also in the lesson. Um, we connect the, the cultural stuff with the mathematics. Um, we look at spear throwers as an inst as instructive games and toys and give you some examples. If you click the um, slide, Rebecca, you'll see there's that game called Calc, which is based on the spear thrower, the traditional toy of the, of the spear thrower. Um, you will also find a maths inquiry lesson to use in the classroom. 
Um, there's there's some information there about connecting with community. Always connect with community where possible. And there's also some cross curriculum connections. Uh, there's also the references there or the consulted works if you want to follow up and find any more information. And there's a list of um, teacher resources that you could use in the classroom too. Okay, Rita May is now going to present that wonderful lesson. Thanks, Katie. Yeah, so the sequence for these lesson plans, um, the first lesson provides the option to collect experimental data and analyze the variable relationships. So this involves an outside activity, so it would be suited to a double lesson, um, but can also be split in two if you need to do that. The second lesson, in the second lesson, students begin in their spear thrower designs. So the idea in these lessons is that they come up with their own design based on the information that they have learnt. So they will have explored the relationship between um, the spear thrower length and the distance that it can throw in the experiment, in the first lesson. In the third lesson, students will create a 3D representation of their designs in virtual reality. The previous lessons have given them the foundation knowledge to create meaningful designs based on their mathematical and scientific understanding. Now, given that these lesson, this lesson plan is aimed at year levels seven to 10, it has been kept quite flexible and there are some variation options written into the lesson plan. So keep an eye out for those. The first section, um, so the the workbook is a resource that I've created to, that goes along with this lesson plan and is referenced throughout the lesson plan. So the first um, activity in the workbook is the experiment. So this is quite heavily scaffolded, but you could do it as a de design task if you decided to do that with your class. Um, the second section is a set of questions that's designed to be accompanied by the first weapons video. This is a five minute video that is um, referenced in the lesson plan and it is a shortened format of the longer version which I would recommend watching if you're interested and if you do intend to use these lessons then that would be a really good um, starting point and it gives a lot of really good rich information. Um, the questions are there to support students to engage with the video um, feel free to use them or don't if you don't think that it's necessary. It's only a five minute video. The next section is the spear thrower design scaffold. This should guide students in their design and ask them to justify their decision, their decisions. So the reason that I did this was because when we did the workshop and we set the task for students to go and do their design challenge, what I found when I was wandering the room that it was that some students were unsure of how to approach the design. Um, and it was okay in that context because each group of students had at least one teacher with them and then there were us facilitating. So we could we could support them really well. But if it's just you in a class, it's probably helpful to have a bit of a design scaffold so that they can read those instructions and prompt themselves along a little bit. Um, the next section, the, the final section, is a glossary of words that might be unfamiliar and new to your students. So this is divided into cultural language and STEM language. Um, students are encouraged to refer to it throughout these lesson plans. Um, their design, they end refer to it throughout their design process. Um, and there's also a jigsaw method activity in which students in small groups will investigate a glossary word and then share their findings with the class. Um, I also just want to note while I'm going through these um, slides, if you have any questions, because I am just briefly going over the lesson plans rather than showing you the whole thing and reading it out step by step. If you have any questions or if it, anything is unclear, feel free to pop it in the chat and I'll try to answer your questions. Um, so in the first lesson, this is the one that has the experiment. In this lesson, we introduce the Woomera as one of the earliest inventions to use the mechanical lever and provide context for the lesson plan sequence. And then we come to the ball thrower as the modern analog for the spear thrower. 
So using the ball thrower, you can conduct an experiment to investigate the relationship between lever arm length and the distance of propulsion. So this experiment is designed to use two different lengths of ball thrower in addition to throwing by hand, so it would require those resources. After collecting the data, students can perform their data analysis. This can include discussion of averages, errors, and outliers, and uh, variable relationships. So the analysis is guided by a couple of questions, but you could take this further if you wanted to. Um, in the, at the end of the lesson, there's a bit of a reflection to try and get them to think about some of the other variable relationships in the motion of using a spear thrower. So this one just thinks about spear thrower length versus how long that spear thrower can throw a spear. So it's just the, the length of the thing and then how far it can throw. But there are so many other variable relationships in that motion that you can try and prompt your students to come up with those. Um, so in the second lesson, students use the information that they have um, gained in the previous lesson to start their design. To begin with this lesson, um, we look at that video and that video, um, which is the shorter version of the first weapons um, episode, it provides um, place-based information. So what we know about cultural learning is that it is best done when it's done on country, so place-based learning. But this isn't always possible and it's not always possible in the classroom. So I think the value of watching a video like this with your students is that it gives them that place-based context through a video, which is, I think, a good thing to try and attempt to bring into the classroom if you can't get out there. So uh, this is when students watch this video and then do those questions. Um, then students do the jigsaw method, as I described before, to familiarize themselves with the glossary. So if anyone doesn't know what that is, just breaking it up, giving each student a word or two, or each small group of students a word, and they can go and um, do a bit of research about that, find a bit of extra information beyond the glossary, and then come back as a class and do a bit of peer learning. So reflect and teach the other students what they've learned about that word. And then they begin to design their own spear throwers. So you would divide your students into small groups, maybe pairs. And whilst this is scaffolded in the workbook, you might like to remind them of the results from the experiment from the previous lesson um, and also prompt them to think about what sort of material materials could be used. For example, mulga is the traditional material used to construct the body because it is very strong, but you might like to think about what modern materials students can think of that are strong as well as lightweight. So encourage creativity with this. They might come up with something like, you know, some particular alloy that's got the characteristics of being really strong, but it's very light. And that would be really suited to this because those are the characteristics that we want in our material. So I think encourage that creativity in this design challenge. So for the, if I can have the next slide, please. So while students are creating their designs, prompt them to annotate using their glossary language. So we're trying to encourage them to use that specific language that we're introducing in these lessons and also symbols to label their diagrams and explain what's going on. You could also prompt students to consider what their spear throw will be used for. So is it used for catching a kangaroo or is it a smaller animal? So what kind of spear thrower, how long does it need to be for that? If you want to throw a heavier spear, you're going to need a shorter spear thrower, those kinds of things. So starting to think about the logistics of it and what does it look like? So in the workbook, there's a space that asks them to draw their design and think maybe you want to draw this from a couple of different angles so you can get the perspective of what this would really start to look like. So sketch and label your design. Um, at the end of the lesson, it would be a good idea to share some of these ideas. So there are a number of 
uh, year seven to 10 content descriptions from the Australian curriculum in design and technology that apply to this design challenge. They can be found uh, at the beginning of the lesson plan resource. So in this um, slide, you can see some pictures of when we did this activity at the workshop and we had students come up with a lot of different designs and some of them put some Indigenous art on it and got really creative with it. Um, in the final lesson in this uh, lesson plan sequence, there's the VR aspect to this where students get to use VR to create a three-dimensional representation of their design. So I'm going to hand over to Rebecca, who is going to explain a bit more about that. Thanks, Rita May. Um, so in the third component of the lesson, um, we had introduced uh, students to the VR technology. So in your context, it might look like um, allowing students to um, experiment with the tools before they're using it, uh, or it could be that you're doing a demonstration in the lesson plan that you'll receive, uh, we've put a link to a, a YouTube uh, video that we've made that just very briefly outlines some of the tools that you can um, use within the VR app that we use, um, but you might make, make your own as well or find something uh, online. So we generally um, provided a, a visual video that explained the different tools that they're using. So within this um, lesson plan, we were using Oculus uh, Quest 2, which is a virtual reality headset that's untethered. So it doesn't, it's not connected to a computer um, and students are fully immersed in the experience by looking through the headset. And they're given um, two handheld controllers, which you can see here on the screen there. Um, there are some other similar devices like that, um, that that all have the similar approach of using handheld devices or even just your hands to point and create content. Um, if you don't have the VR technology, there are many other 3D design tools that you can use and I'll, I'll cover some of those shortly. So what we had was um, we suggested that students could take their designs um, and work in teams to co-create together one single solution um, together uh, and they're really essentially bringing their 2D designs to life in 3D which um, Rita May was talking about. So uh, within our workshop we did it as a rapid design process where students grouped up in about um, five per group and they all had a few minutes to go through and co-create their designs in open brush which is um, a 3D uh, painting tool so you can essentially create and design in an open space uh, walking around using different paintbrush options and colors and, and textures and uh, we had students all um, doing like a, a speed collaboration process where they all had a, a responsibility over a component and then they all added to that and then if they'd finished their spear thrower uh, they could then create um, the surrounding environment and really make uh, the user who was going to view their design feel immersed in that space. And then we uh, allowed some time for sharing and reflection at the end. If you're working in a classroom in a school you might extend out that uh, 3D design stage over a few lessons and really allow students the time to iterate on their designs. Um, but if you don't have a lot of time, you can also do this very quickly. We ran the whole workshop in an hour. Um, so it is possible um, to do it quite fast and you let them know that this was very you know, agile. You're working quite quickly through that. And so connecting to um, here we're connecting to digital technologies curriculum, which is uh, around using digital tools for a purpose. Um, but you could also incorporate other elements of design and technologies as well. And so in the next few slides, I'd like to share some example creations by students at the 2023 Aboriginal STEM Student Congress in Adelaide, which is an event run by the Department of Education in South Australia, just to give you a sense of what, what it looks like and how they're creating their own content. So here we are watching Nathan design his spear thrower. So you can see there um, we're casting to an iPad. So that's also one option so that 
um, we're thinking about ways that people can um, share in the experience. So when one person is using the headset, you might be able to um, also allow others to provide right, feedback at the time and to uh, contribute to their creation. And also you can screencast to a screen. So you might um, showcase the work on a projector. And you can see here, we've got another couple of examples there. So I'll play these. And you can see here students, um, this is a recording. So one way to capture students' creations could be to um, uh, screencast or to record. You can actually record what students are creating in the app. So in Open Brush or Tilt Brush, um, you can have that function as well. And here we had an option where we had students working with another 3D design tool, which is Gravity Sketch. And this is essentially um, a 3D design tool that students can maneuver on an iPad um, and draw with their finger or an iPad, iPad pencil if you have one. So we just provided different options for students to participate. If you don't have technology in your context, um, you could also do it uh, with craft materials or recyclables or anything that you find in the environment. Um, so students here were using a combination of Play-Doh as well as um, uh, different types of uh, fabrics and uh, strings and things like that. So there are other ways that students can still create 3D design creations in um, alternative ways. So here we've got a bit of a video that shows how the students are interacting. So here knows the way that they're working and the type of We loved um, participating in um, the STEM Congress. It's been amazing. And the students just come up with um, so many incredible solutions. It's, it blows us away every year. We've done that for a few years now, um, looking at fishing nets and traps and architecture as well. Um, so uh, also there are many 3D design tools. So let us know in the chat if you've used any of these tools in your classroom. Um, we've been using, experimenting with some of these and there are many more um, coming out all the time on VR and AR. Um, and uh, there are many different ways you can allow students to create their content. So they could use augmented reality where they're designing something and then overlaying it onto, you know, in, in the classroom live um, and sharing that around so everyone can see. Um, or you can do the fully immersive experience with 3D design. And the focus when we think about selecting the tools is really around, you know, the student, student's age, um, access, you know, is it free, um, is it easy to use, um, but also thinking about what you're wanting to achieve. So uh, we quite like the ones where students can freely draw and create like Gravity Sketch or Tilt Brush um, and Open Brush so that students can use their own symbols and representations. Um, but also Tinkercad where students are working with existing shapes and, and plugging and playing or creating their own uh, as well are, are brilliant. And some of these tools are also able to connect together. So you can take um, something from created in Tinkercad and then project it into a, a virtual environment in another program. So there's lots of ways you can connect. Um, also Minecraft is another popular one that students are using in many schools and you could have students use it, the blocks to construct their own designs um, as well. So I'm just going to hand back to yes. Kate. Thanks for that, Rebecca. I love, I love that, how we've taken this this um, amazing technology, the projectile technologies of the spear thrower and then using this cutting 
edge technology um, to, to represent it, to get kids to design their own. So fantastic. And thanks, Kim Martin. Yes, the ABC does have teacher resources to support that um, First Nations, uh, that First Weapons episodes. So we've had a look at, um, we've, as we said at the start, use the Gumpi model. The critical reflection part of that is what you have just seen, where the kids have taken what they've learned through from the reality, abstracting, uh, looking at the maths and the physics, um, doing their own representations, um, designing their own, and then creating their own using the um, using the virtual reality and the the um, digital technologies. So it's a fabulous process. Um, it was amazing working with the kids and seeing them actually come up with all these different different designs was was fantastic. Um, so yep, the I'll hand it back to Beck for this last one again, just talking about those three lessons that we've made available for you. Yes. Uh, and we've got, um, so we've done the same process for fishing nets and traps, spear throwers, um, and geodesic architecture. So you have access to three different um, lesson plans uh, on our CESAR website, and we'll email that through to you uh, after this session. Um, as you can see here, students are using these different tools as well as the um, uh, craft equipment as well. So learning opportunities are always, um, if possible, contextualised and deepened when you are connecting with um, your local Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community. So we have, uh, we through, um, uh, through communities, through their knowledge and through languages. So we sort of have a framework for doing that, um, depending on where you are in your community. Um, and that is acknowledging as a first step, acknowledging community, acknowledging knowledge, acknowledging culture, acknowledging language, acknowledging in this case, material culture, where possible, Consult, that connect should actually say consult. I didn't pick that up. So the middle one is consulting with community where possible, um, talking with community, asking community about what, what, what's out there, what's available. And then finally, the if you can, getting community into the classroom or into the school and collaborating with community on the on the on the learning. So, um, and that collaboration always provides opportunities for two-way learning that is essential for creating, implementing and evaluating resources, teaching and learning strategies and curriculum content, et cetera. And we, as I said before, we know that all students benefit. Okay, so we'd love to hear um... What is your key takeaway from today's session? Um, pop your uh, response in the chat um, and we'll also activate, um, we've got a poll there. We'd love to just capture where you're at now. Um, we understand that you know, this is a learning journey that's continuous. Um, you know, it doesn't end. We're continually uh, learning and growing in this space. Um, so we'd love to hear um, where you're at as well. And we won't share these on the screen. Uh, this is just for our own information. Okay, so while you're doing that, I'm just going to uh, keep moving across. Um, we'd love to give a shout out to Atsuma. Um, if you join as a member, you can discover professional learning events and resources. They've got fabulous lesson plans. You can see the video um, by Professor Chris Matthews explaining the Gumpy model, as well as uh, unpacking other elements of the Gumpy model um, as a pedagogy. And they've got many more things. Um, they've got a brilliant event that's biannual, uh, which we just went to the other week, um, which was amazing. So jump on there and have a look at the resources. Um, we have the lesson plans here. So if you would like to download the spear thrower lesson plan, uh, you can either scan the QR code on the screen or you can um, access it using the bit.ly link there. 
Uh, we will also email out participants who attended today as well, just to follow up there. Uh, if you uh, are interested in learning more, uh, we have um, free uh, online courses through our caesarmooks.adelaide.edu.au website. So we have court free teacher professional learning courses covering uh, mathematics. And we also have some uh, digital technologies courses. Uh, so we look at um, different emerging areas. We've currently got cybersecurity online um, and available at a small cost, um, but we will have a suite of um, other digital technologies courses launching before the end of this year. So we have Digital Technologies Foundations, uh, renamed as Decoding Digital Tech, and we have um, one looking at digital technologies across the curriculum. So jump on there and um, find out more. We also have a national lending library currently funded through the Australian Government Department of Education. And this allows schools to freely borrow equipment like virtual reality, augmented reality. Uh, we have co-spaces accounts that you can borrow uh, for your school. We have priority going to schools who are remote or rural or perhaps low ICSIA or have high First Nations student enrollment. So uh, if you would love to do these activities in your classroom with 3D design tools, jump on, request something, um, and we can send your kit, um, school a kit at no cost. Um, we also have other lesson plans on um, covering the architecture and um, the fishing nets and traps, which you can find on the lending library page. So they're under the AR kit and the VR kit. Um, so jump on and have a look at the resources there. Uh, we also have um, a, a program with in partnership with Education Services Australia, which is um, um, maths in schools and this one the ESA have launched a mathematics hub which has some brilliant resources to support mathematics in the classroom and they have new resources by Stronger Smarter Institute which is a First Nations Australian education organization uh, and you can see there on the uh, on the screen they've got connections to country and various contexts that they're unpacking for mathematics so jump on there and have a look uh, and you can also subscribe to their e-newsletter to hear about upcoming events. We have one with uh, Dr. Katie Morris, uh, which is around unpacking the rich context over three webinars. And this starts next week um, and then is weekly. So um, jump onto the Mathematics Hub and under the Maths in Schools professional learning page, you'll navigate to webinars and that's where you can enroll or you'll find in the chat, I've popped the registration link there today. Um, we also have our maths courses, which are on the maths hub, um, covering F to 2, 3 to 6, and 7 to 10. And we've been so fortunate to uh, have Atsuma consult and develop content for our courses, which uh, incorporates culturally responsive maths pedagogies, uh, like the lessons that you've seen today. So if you jump in there, there's so so much um, brilliant content developed by Atsuma, uh, unpacking the Gumpi model and um, bringing it to life in real, authentic, rich lesson plans for the classroom. Uh, you can follow us on social media. So uh, both Atsuma and uh, Caesar are on social, so we always love to connect and you can find about upcoming, uh, you know, events and resources that come out and go live. So jump on and connect with us there. Okay, that brings us to the end of the session. So um, we would love to uh, hear from you. If you have any questions or comments about the session, please drop them into the chat here or in the comments below if you're watching on demand. Um, we're also happy to receive emails. So at Caesar or at Atsuma, please uh, feel free to get in touch and email us. So we might uh, stop the recording there, but if anyone has any other questions, 